So thanks for having me. Uh, what, what, what I want to mention up front is you owe me for a, a variety of reasons. One is I put a suit on today, especially for you people. And thanks to uh, those of you in the audience that have done the same. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is uh, to give my presentation a little bit of legitimacy. Unlike the Cisco guys, I'm not actually paid uh, to be here, although I've got to admit I have accepted the occasional bribe. In fact, it was only one. And uh, I attended a Cisco conference in the States, and they gave me a flip phone. And uh, I came home and showed it to my 13-year-old daughter. And she went, cool, a mobile phone. Uh, not flip phone, sorry, the flip camera. She said, cool, a mobile phone. And I said, no, 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 it's, it's actually it's a video camera. She said, cool, a mobile phone with a video camera. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, no, no, it's just a video camera. And she said, what's the point of that? <laughs> um, but, but you're going you're gonna to hear me... Um, you're going to hear me talking about video actually quite a lot. You know, there, there is a point to video, whether it's the flip or not, is, uh, we'll see. And uh, I want to say I don't agree with Cisco on everything. Uh, first of all, I don't agree it was a good idea to put that lectern that none of us are using on the stage, because that means you guys can't see some of these slides. Um, the other one is uh, I don't agree this stuff is actually new. You know, so um, in a collaboration that's been going on for quite a long time, and we're, we're constantly trying to improve it. Um, and uh, that is the, th the theme of the conference. And that's what I'm going to talk about from Cambridge. I'm going to talk about Cambridge a bit. I'm going to talk about organizational issues that affect collaboration, particularly at uh, Cambridge. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we collaborate at, at Cambridge. And uh, I'm genuinely concerned that you do actually get value out of my presentation. There's probably only a couple of things in it you know, that, you'd, that you would remember. And, uh, and I will talk about a couple of critical success factors that you need. Uh, to make collaboration a success in the organization. I've kind of learned over the years in investment banking and, uh, you know, more recently, the University of Cambridge. So I'm going to talk about the University of Cambridge a little bit. It's a research-led university. Um, it's consistently ranked uh, number one for research in Europe. Um, there is a global ranking of, of uh, research universities uh, in which, you know, recently we're kind of second, second to Harvard. Uh, and uh, for what it's worth, on sort of research rankings of universities in the UK, we tend to come out second. So it, sh you know, it shows that those, those rankings aren't, uh, aren't that accurate. But the other thing, uh, the other thing to um, understand is 80% of the research funding in the, the UK goes to five universities. You know, I've, got a, I've got a colleague here from Imperial, that's another one of them. Um, and Cambridge is a research powerhouse. I'm going to talk about some of the research that is done at Cambridge. It's kind of really interesting. Uh, when you look into it, and Cambridge seeks to excel, seeks to be great, not good, in every area of research it undertakes. And it is brutal at Cambridge when you are heading a department which isn't kind of getting 100% on its impact factors and its ratings. You know, in which, in which case, you are, you are running a department, whatever it is doing, that would be extremely highly regarded in almost any other organisation. And at Cambridge, it's a little bit tough, because our standard is that in, in effect, you know, the, the research group you are running should be rated number one, you know, in, in the area in which it is uh, seeking to excel. There are 40,000 people at the University of Cambridge, but more than that, Cambridge actually represents this ecosystem where um, the, what I joke about is, uh, you know, if, if actually in the street, we've got, we've got equipment in the basement outside my building, and you see tramps lying on top of the grill that is, that is in the street outside. They are probably something to do with the University of Cambridge. Um, so uh, there's the Cancer Research UK organisation, which is down. We've got this massive campus, the Addenbrookes campus, which is a research university, uh, medical campus in, southern, in South Cambridge. Um, medical research, MRC, Medical Research Council, are down there. Cancer Research UK are down there. The NHS are down there in a big way. Um, Papworth, for what it's, what, uh, for what it's worth, um, is moving from Papworth down to the Addenbrookes campus. They're relocating the entire university and sort of building this ecosystem. Those people do not work for the University of Cambridge. They're not technically part of the University of Cambridge. But when we're creating these collaborative networks, which is going to be a common theme uh, you'll see in, in my talk, it includes as much a medical researcher who's employed by the NHS or a medical researcher that's include, uh, employed by Cancer Research UK as much as it does some guy that happens to be on the payroll of the University of Cambridge. And when we talk about 40,000 people at the University of Cambridge, I'm not talking about the ecosystem, I'm talking about what we call the University of Cambridge, of whom only 8,500 are in the payroll system. If you look at the, if you, if you go to that, you go to the personnel system and look in there, right? So it really is a, a broad church. And the other thing to understand about the University of Cambridge, it has been around 800 years, 
the way the university operates is we're quite keen to still be around in 800 years' time. So the, the way the university operates, it thinks for the long term. You know, we still regret decisions that were taken 150 years ago. Um, you know, but to put it in context, and I used to work for Merrill Lynch, and uh, we would do something, uh, you know, two weeks was a long time at Merrill Lynch. Um, and generally projects we would do at Merrill Lynch, we'd say, look, it's going to take three months. But the, the, uh, I very rarely had the argument, it's too expensive. I always had the argument, why can't you do it in two months? You know, I thought we'd be killing ourselves to do it in three. Um, here's first uh, genuine piece of value added, which is there's, there's a report called the 21st or, uh, Century Organization uh, from McKinsey and Co. Um, I think if you go to the McKinsey Co. website, you've got to be some kind of premium account holder and pay their money to actually read it. Whereas in fact, if you just Google for it, you find it is out there um, <laughs> on the web. And uh, what it actually tells you, first of all, is 21st century organizations have an increasing number of, of, knowledge, of knowledge workers, and uh, they are unproductive. They're not as productive as they should be, and you, su you should enhance those. Um, those knowledge workers are particularly generating ideas, and uh, the point I want to make clear, all my experience kind of tells me, we're not actually short of ideas, typically. But making these knowledge workers more productive, it's all about execution. You tend to get lots and lots of ideas. Uh, the difference, um, this implementing a collaboration framework, a collaboration environment within your companies, um, it's not so much the idea that is great, it's how you execute. Um, I don't actually think it's about how much money you've spent. You know, a successful collaboration project doesn't have to cost a lot of money. An unsuccessful one can cost um, a lot of money. But it's much more about how you can successfully execute programs than it is about, could we just gather every idea that everybody could possibly have, all right? But when you, you'll see in this article, uh, they actually emphasize the idea generation. They talk about organizations being flawed in that a hierarchical, a rigid hierarchical organization is flawed, which we all tend to agree with, except when we're referring to the hierarchy underneath ourselves. Um, and uh, they talk about matrix management uh, being flawed. And here is another key point from, from Cambridge, they talk about the importance of the creation of networks within those companies that have increasing number of knowledge workers. Uh, here's another area where I disagree with, uh, with Cisco. I don't think that you should stick the word social in front of the word networks. I don't know how many of you guys have signed up for LinkedIn, for example. When you get an email from LinkedIn, it kind of says, please join my professional network. It doesn't say, please join my social network. And frankly, if you want to sell this thing within your companies, if you call it a social network, uh, you know, people aren't going to actually be too, pressed, too impressed. Nevertheless, um, it is a key um, strategic development within the University of Cambridge of this evolution of the need to support networks. And I've meeting certainly every week with different people um, about how can we optimize our support for networks. So you've got stem cell research, researchers, for example, working in one area, another area, another area. We've almost got a formal, we haven't really formalized it, but we've, we've almost got a cookie cutter set of things we do uh, to create a stem cell network. And they aren't people that are all employed within the same organization, but it's got a structure to it, and those, and those people kind of work together. And it's almost become a uh, cookie cutter at Cambridge. So, um, talking about the, the concept of an organizational unit, at Cambridge, I chose somewhere at random, uh, which is the clinical neurosciences department, and I absolutely chose it at random. Uh, you can tell that clinical neurosciences exists as a department of the University of Cambridge because it has a website. You know, you go to the departmental website, kind of makes sense, and uh, sort of explains uh, it, it, there is such a thing as clinical neu neuroscience. By the time I get to the end of this little theme, you'll find out it's a very abstract concept. Within uh, clinical neurosciences, there's the Cambridge Centre for Brain Repair, there's the Neurology Unit, there's Neurosurgery, and there's a Brain Imaging Centre. These are like sub-departments of the clinical neurosciences department. I'm going to talk about brain repair. Um, and uh, brain repair, again, like clinical neuroscience, exists as an entity within the University of Cambridge. You think it's something you can kind of get your arms around. And I'm going to talk about the research that is done in the Brain Repair Centre. And this has got nothing to do with Cisco whatsoever. Um, but, you know, something to take home, basically, which is the areas of research in the Brain Repair Centre at Cambridge are all to do with neurological disorders. Brain is basically made up of uh, neurons, nerve cells. And if you talk about Alzheimer's, that is a protein that attacks uh, neurons in the brain, causing widespread neuron loss, either because the protein is causing these neurons to tangle or because this sort of crud builds up, called plaque, um, that affects the brain. Glaucoma is actually a neurological disorder affecting the retinal cells, again, nerve cells in your eye. 
And if it makes you feel any better about it, you are four times as likely to get glaucoma as you are to get Alzheimer's. Um, but you, if you get glaucoma, only 10% only of you will go completely blind. So, uh, multiple sclerosis is the largest cause of disability among young, young adults, second only to trauma, i.e. injury through accident or, or whatever. Um, and, you know, so it's you know, particularly tough it, it, given the population it, it, it affects, i.e. young adults. Spinal cord, cord injury, you kind of understand that, what that is, but the challenge is there is how do you get the nerves to regrow um, past the site of injury, and when they do regrow past the site of injury, you want them to reconnect properly. You don't want them to reconnect at random. So this is the kind of work that goes on within what we call the Brain Repair Centre at the University of Cambridge, and let's be honest, they're things you care about. Um, and I'm going to talk about collaboration and, and kind of how it fits. There's um, animal experimentation involved within this unit. So there are some things that you will be listening to me thinking, you know, it's kind of interesting, it's a fun topic. Um, it may or may, I'm not sure there's any parallels in the organisation that I work for, um, but this isn't a loosey-goosey kind of thing. You know, in terms of when these people are collaborating, it's got to be secure. Uh, you know, our, our treatment, then anybody who legitimately is doing research involving animals, then immediately becomes a target for uh, a personal attack. Um, so, you know, we have issues not dissimilar to corporate world about, you know, how secure actually is this stuff. Now I'm going to zoom out a little bit, or a lot actually, um, a bit like you would do with a sort of planet or a universe, you come step back, step, step back, back, back. Um, our departments are structured in things called schools, some other universities call them faculties, we call them schools, we've got six of them. The School of Clinical Medicine, um, within which clinical neurosciences is kind of the second one that's listed on, the, on this chart here. There are, there are others, you know, paediatrics, oncology, are you looking into cancers, um, hematology, psychiatry, looking at brain disorder. Uh, all within the School of Clinical Medicine. But we have another faculty or school, the School of Biological Sciences, which has got within it groups that are very much looking into biochemistry. Now, when you talk about uh, neurological disorder, there's either something attacking the nerves or the biochemistry around the nerves is kind of wrong, causing the, ner the nerves to suffer, or the biochemistry inside the nerve cells has gone wrong, you know, causing the, uh, the nerves to kind of lose, lose their function. But so there are cognate disciplines in the School of Biological Sciences, which isn't predominantly on the, the medical campus. It's, it's uh, elsewhere in Cambridge. So um, you can see this whole theme has been trying to understand uh, what affects the way people at Cambridge may need to con collaborate. And all I'm kind of suggesting here is you can think about it in the context of your own organisation, which is I chose brain repair at random. And uh, the truth is, when you look into it, you can find uh, the need for making collaboration more, more effective kind of pretty, pretty easily, and I kind of encourage you to do the same within, uh, within your organisations, and it is, it is difficult to support. And the key thing to point is these arrows do not go upwards, you know, up through the organisation. And what that actually means at the University of Cambridge is um, clinical neurosciences is just one of these dots. And the way we are structured at the University of Cambridge, and we do, uh, you know, excel in most areas we do kind of research in, um, so we are doing something right, is, um, I don't want to say this part of it is irrelevant, but this, this part of it is extremely light touch. And our goal is, is to make these, these functions as successful as we, as we possibly, possibly can by directly delivering support uh, to, to these organisations. Okay, so... Um, that ends this, this little bit of the presentation, but um, it was m intending to illustrate that Cambridge is kind of a hotbed of the need for effective collaboration. If we couldn't collaborate effectively within Cambridge, we wouldn't be successful in terms of the work uh, that we do. And uh, I kind of talk about this thing as enthusiastically to my friends that are still working in the investment banking industry. And uh, the there's a colleague of mine at JP Morgan Chase, and uh, with that charming attitude Americans do have, um, so, you know, can you just cut the crap and just tell us, tell me, what are you doing now that you think we might be doing in five years' time? Because uh, I think that would probably be more saleable. Now, this is a genuine conversation from a year ago, and my answer then was, uh, it's actually collaboration. What, what are we doing um, that you might not be doing that makes it effective for our knowledge workers to collaborate? Um, and, you know, don't under, understate it. I mean, we've got... Oracle Financials at the University of Cambridge. We've got some PeopleSoft-based personnel system. We've, 
constantly trying to work out how to manage our um, you know, project grant processes effectively and stuff like that. But that is not the dominant theme you know, of the University of Cambridge, not over the past five years. I know whatever we're doing with Oracle Financials, we were doing it five years ago and five years before that and five years before that as well. It hasn't really changed. Um, but it's it's peer to peer um, uh, collaboration, and I'm going to have a slight diversion, and because uh, I don't think this is five years outside of the academic industry, I think it might be ten years um, outside the academic industry, which is we have a mechanism within the academic industry which is relatively recent, which is that I can log on to resources at Harvard, but using my Cambridge credentials. And, uh, and if you, if you cut and, and vice versa, so in other words, if I've got a website at Cambridge, I can say, you know, Ian Lewis at Cambridge can access it, Fred Smith at Cambridge can access it, and Joe Blow from MIT.edu can access it. And you, we can't do that in industry. Um, and it is kind of a critical requirement, otherwise it makes it hard to collaborate. So you'll see that Cisco has created a website that's free, uh, um, I think it's aimed at the... HE sector, but I'm pretty sure anybody can use it, called getideas.org, and it's based on their enterprise collaboration platform. That, understandably, has its own authentic, you know, you sign up for it, you get a password through an email, and then you kind of log on. And uh, we don't have to do that in academia. And one day, uh, that is going to affect, affect you guys. And share how important it is, um, this theme of measurements, by the way, is about the only other piece of value added I'm going to do in, in this presentation, and particularly in the question and answer session. Uh, which is, if the tools you provide in this space are optional to use, that makes them a special case in terms of IT service delivery within a company. It, you, and you've got to recognize that up front. Um, if you deliver an FX options trading system, those FX traders are going to click on it, you know, because they can't do their job otherwise. When you deliver an alternative kind of tool, as I've done both, a CRM system, most salesmen can do their job whether they go into the CRM system or not. You know, there is no comparison. The most significant differences between those two systems isn't one's, one's written in Java and one's written in PHP or, you know, something like that. The biggest, biggest difference is uh, the CRM system is optional to use. And so these, and that's probably the most valuable thing I can tell you, is, is to recognize that up front, which means you've got to have measurements in place that give you an idea of whether it's successful or not. And I can absolutely assure you the most valuable metric you can have of a system that is optional to use is unique users per week. You, you can vary the time scale if you like, but it's how many different people went into that system and used it. And when you try and get that metric out of your own IT people, they will tell you, oh, no, no, we can do gigabytes per you know, or something, and it's going to be much, much better, it'll be cleverer. You go, yep, yep, that's great, as long as I get how many people have used it. And uh, often you get all these clicks and clocks and bytes and, and things like that. And you cannot communicate that outside the IT, IT organization. I can still remember the figures for the Merrill Lynch CRM system. We had an old system, that, not, it wasn't old, it was, it was the new system built on the crap of the one before it. And it, it, um, it was $25 million we spent building it. And it had 400 users a week. And uh, but at least we had that metric. We knew how many people were using it. Uh, you can get loads of other metrics. You know, how many people are submitting reports for this, how many people are getting them out, and all this kind of junk. But the main thing, like you, you want to know, is how many users a week. It was 400. New head of global relationship management or something at Merrill Lynch says, this system is crap. What are we going to do? Not what are we going to do about it. He actually said, every day I drive in, there's some guy on the radio. There's a spoof radio show about an IT guy, and his answer to every question is nine months. So he says, I already know what you're going to tell me. You're going to tell me nine months. And that was his entire... Um, and uh, my caliber as an IT professional is I couldn't blow 25 million in nine months. I just don't know how to do it. Um, and so we ended up spending three million dollars replacing this prior uh, CRM system. And we got it up to 4,000 unique users per week. You know, and I think everybody in the room kind of, you know, that kind of makes sense. I understood that number. Um, well, you want to go back into your own organizations and find out if you get a meaningful metric like that. You know, wireless networking. What we do within our industry is we don't really compete. So Cambridge is not really competing with Imperial. It's not really competing with, you know, Warwick or UCL or something like that. One thing we can say is, how's your wireless network compared to ours? And uh, the challenge I have is trying to agree a metric that hasn't got gigabookers in it. So, um, you know, unique users per week. And I can tell you, eight and a half thousand different people 
connect, because you have to authenticate to go to the wireless network, so it's not rocket science. Eight and a half thousand different people connect via the Cambridge wireless network each week. Now, I don't mind if another university picks a month instead of a week or, or something else, but at least that's a number you understand. We're eight and a half thousand, Warwick is some other number, and you kind of compare things. So unique users per week. Coming back to this point, which is Shibboleth, you can authenticate. We didn't announce it, so back at the end of 2007, um, we just provided the capability that suddenly, when you went to some external um, web base, it's all web based, you had some external resources, without us announcing it, uh, this is actually per month, but 3,000 users per month started using it without us actually having told them that this capability was now available. And if you look at it today, it's up to something like 8,000, and we're only talking about 8,500 people on the payroll. Okay, even though I admit it's a, lot, it's a much larger e ecosystem than that, that can authenticate by this mechanism, but 8,500 people per month are taking advantage of the fact uh, they can authenticate to something on the network, and it then in fact pings back to Cambridge for us to confirm that they are who they say they are. That's the way the mechanism works. Um, and the message I want to get across is more about the metric. I could have given you thousands of bytes and bits and logons and, and stuff like that. It's just how many people have done it? Because it is optional. They don't have to do it. Um, and again, this is a diversion. But the truth is, there's not much out there that you can authenticate via this shibboleth mechanism. At the beginning, this is, this is how many different sort of website stroke applications can you connect to? Maybe I'll do it up here, because I know you guys can't see down there. Um, and it was 10. And now, it's 90. Which is not many. So we're talking about there's 8,000 people at Cambridge, and uh, institutions are doing this all across academia, are only going to 90 different resources. You know, on the web, they can authenticate you know, bulletin boards or, or share things, or um, in particular, access journal, you know, uh, academic papers and journals. Uh, but nevertheless, huge numbers of them do. So um, you know, coming back to the real world, anyway, um, uh, we implemented a VoIP-based phone system um, at Cambridge, the registrar at Cambridge. I showed him these phones. He said, oh, it looks like a phone. Um, <laughs> Okay, so the first thing, we understood that if you put phones in, you, you have to be able to pick it up, dial a number, talk to somebody. Uh, this, is a, this is a photograph of the whiteboard in my office. We spent a lot of time. Now, our old, fist, old phone system was in for 25 years. And that isn't because we suck. It's because we were amazingly clever when we put it in 25 years ago. We put something that's, that's got a life to it. That set the challenge. When we replace it, we want to replace it with something that is going to be in for 25 years. That is kind of the model we had. And it's going to sound inconceivable. You put in a Cisco call manager. How could it be? Now, like the janitor's brush, we may change the handle and change the head a few times. <laughs> but, and I'm actually serious, you will be able to recognize at Cambridge what we put in today uh, from what we've done in 25 years' time. You'll be able to see what are the things that we did are still recognisable. Even though, you know, the call manager, I'm sure, would have disappeared and would have put in Nortel, you know. Um, <laughs> now, the clever things we did, which I could never have done at Merrill Lynch, um, because there's too much pressure to say, put it in, put it in now, 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 put it in yesterday, um, is we tried to design our system from the get-go that it would be web-based. I'm going to talk a little bit about each, each of these. We tried to design it from the get-go that the phone system didn't care where the handsets were. Basically, it means you can put them as easily in your house as you can in the office. And it's not true that you can generally do that in industry. There's too much VPN crapola involved. Um, this is much cleverer than it looks, which is you can make phone calls via the internet from our handsets. We'll call it handsets. Obviously, soft clients' handsets are the same thing. Um, that call can route via the internet as easily as it can via the PSDN, both the outbound calls and inbound calls. And uh, we are the Alexander Graham Bells of this world at the moment, in that there is nobody on the other end. We're trying to, we're trying to agree <laughs> with uh, MIT that if they could do the same thing as us. Now, the state of the art, what, what do you mean? We could put in a SIP trunk between us and you. You go, yeah, we know we could do that. Then that's the same as two offices of Barclays Bank. You know, you've kind of got a common phone environment. Um, if you dial, you can dial, if you get a soft client and you dial ijl20 at cam.ac.uk, my phone will ring. You know, you can kind of call me and the clever bit about it is how do you stop voice spam? How do you, how do you stop, when Russia works out to do it, how do you stop one PC in Russia, like calling every phone? But the fact is you can do it. There, there are mechanisms you can do it that establish a trust first. Um, and the system where it's VoIP, the V in our system is absolutely from the ground up video and voice agnostic. And you can, assu you can assume that. You've, 
you see that a fair bit. So um, what does it mean to make it web-based? Well, we've implemented, we're trying to think, what are the things you'd actually want to do on the web? You don't want to make a phone call of the web. Um, but there are things you can do, and we've built a variety of them um, that mean you can interact with the phone system via the web, including things like click to dial. Uh, the only clever thing, we, click to dial is fairly obvious, the only clever thing we've done about it is we can do it on any web page. You don't have to go into a special application, which is, hey, guess what, you can, if you click these numbers on this page, you can dial. Um, uh, the handset location agnostic thing just kind of makes sense, but you've got to keep in mind that we want it to be video and audio agnostic, agnostic so you want to be able to do want to be able to do either, and we did have my colleague, American colleague who runs the networking division, roamed the United States, because he's back home anyway, and every motel he went into, he plugged the phone in. Um, and he was back at Cambridge. He was kind of connected. And it's not rocket science, because it's all IP. Um, and you, basically, that is, that is the University of Cambridge, or King's College. Um, calling via the internet. Um, on its own, just for audio telephone calls, is fairly irrelevant, because the cost of a phone call um, is, is diminishing to zero. Um, so you know, we're, um, we're at the point where we've agreed the cost lower than our current telecom expense. Um, we can agree fixed price, a bit like you do at home. You pay 30 pounds, everything's included. You can do that corporately. And uh, we've been negotiating with NTL and BT. We've been negotiating with them about, look, if we just paid you a fixed sum of money, how much would it be? And we were surprised to find, but first of all, it can be lower than what you're currently paying. The other is that price can include, for the fixed price, can include all short and long distance UK calls, calls to mobile phones, and all international calls to countries that don't have a tin pot dictatorship running the country, which means they might crank up their end. So, you know, all, all the sort of normal countries are all included for the fixed price, um, which we will do. We kind of negotiate the price, we're just trying to work out how to technically to minimize a reduction in alternate routing we would if we if we put all our eggs into one vendor's basket we might not have the cool resilient alternate routing that we've got at the moment that's the only challenge we've got um, and what that means is by the way if somebody puts a, <laughs> puts one of our phones in their house we're gonna knock yourself out and that's really worth having because you make free because it's a bit like if we give somebody a web connection in their house it doesn't cost us anything we've already got two 40 gigabit connections to the internet so you know putting undergraduates on it or putting people you can connect via your house it's a uh, fixed price to us. Um, and this bit doesn't matter if you're making audio calls because they are so cheap. Anyway, it makes a big difference if you want to make a video call. You know, you cannot, ro you say you're, you're trying to do this with a funky phone, doing it from your desk. You can't do it over the PSTN, let's be realistic about it. That call has got to be routed via the internet. It's a prerequisite. Um, and this is not our model for video calling. Um, we don't believe anybody actually wants to use a phone with a, with a screen on it and a camera on it. Um, our model is much more, it assumes if you've, got a PC, if you've got a phone, there will be a PC with a much bigger screen right next to it. And so once you're forced to displaying video in this little window, it, is, it just illustrates your failure. You somehow couldn't get that video image to come up on the much bigger screen that is kind of right next door. Um, and that's a model we espouse. I think Cisco is doing the right thing in that, um, you know, if that's the best thing you can do at the moment, you're exercising all the technologies you will need to have when you actually make it such that somebody actually wants to use it, you know, which is basically moving it over there. Um, and to talk about video a bit, this is Skype. Um, this is kind of the state of the art of our use of video, and we use Skype a lot at the University of Cambridge. Um, for undergraduate interviews, for example. Every college uses Skype to do some of those. Um, but, it's not collaboration. It's basically a phone, it's a phone call collaboration. Well, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I should have said at the beginning, by the way, by far the largest t uh, collaboration tool is email. You know, being realistic about like, how new is this and how clever is this. It's going to stay email for quite a long time. Most people are collaborating via email, mostly. Um, we've got a lot of other things. Uh, this is more like a phone call. It's just got video on it. The bit we care about here is WebEx. Is You can see what's happened is, well, which screen I should point to? This one. Um, the video window, or nominally what we call the video window, has become this big. Okay, now on the previous model, what we're kind of assuming in terms of video is how big can I make the picture of them? Uh, and that's not actually, for collaboration, isn't the important part. The important part is this bit, and this bit still has a little way to go, but it already is the dominant part of our use of these tools at Cambridge. Um, you might want this so you can kind of see if people are waving or pointing or something like that that interacting by the common bit is really the more important part. And it's the same as, um, I'm sure, you know, everybody's 
uh, you know, extremely knowledgeable here with video. It's not the quality of the video that is the most important thing when you're doing something like this. It's the quality of the audio. You know, because if they're a bit fuzzy, you can go away. But as long as this bit isn't fuzzy, um, you can get away with it. If the audio is bad, um, you know, it's really not going to work. And if you look at telepresence, it hasn't just got kick-ass video, it's got kick-ass audio as well, which is really, really quite impressive. Um, uh, this is a Cambridge room, and the only reason I put it up was uh, to illustrate this bit. It's all very well to be looking at the, these, these are different groups of people elsewhere. Um, there's at least as much emphasis placed on what's going on on this window in a, in a Cambridge video conference. And uh, again, somebody mentioned here earlier that these are the sort of, um, I don't want to call them sort of male, pale and stale, but they're people like me. Um, that's <laughs> not the, this is a niche hobby at Cambridge. The most important use of um, video conferencing is, is this, where this is just an individual researcher in the Brain Repair Centre, and he didn't have to go and use a room that somebody prepared an hour before he got there, got there had the video conference, complained about the audio video quality and left, and then somebody tied it up after they left. That is a neat, we do that at Cambridge. Um, this, is, this is one of the rooms we use. It's a niche hobby. It's not the important use of video conferencing. And you've got to be very careful that the chief executive doesn't think, because he's the guy that's having these, these pre-prepared ones, um, thinks this is what video conferencing is, because it's not. It's not, it's not video collaboration. It's a niche, niche use. Uh, and telepresence obviously moves the, sets the standard uh, forward in terms of um, just how good can it be and just make no mistake about it from a collaboration standpoint this thing that, this thing here that is that is concealed behind that telephone um, very quickly becomes really really important the, 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 your ability to interact uh, with that part of the video conference the, the the interactive bit of the shared workspace from a collaboration standpoint turns out to be more important than perhaps we suspected. At the beginning, we just thought, you know, give us, a, give us a camera and a screen at the other end, and now I can go and I go like that, and somebody else can see, you know, bye, you got, and they can see you do it. That was kind of our goal, and that wasn't very long ago. But after you've got that bit working, you then start shrinking the, that part, and you worry a lot about that part. Um, just to talk about the, the network at Cambridge, we own our own fibres in the streets. So there are manholes with my name on uh, you know, dotted all, all over the place, and it is an incredible luxury. Um, we have up here somewhere, there's, there's physics around here. Two years ago or so, I learned this new phrase where collaborating, a lot of the data that's coming from the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland is processed at data, it's petabytes. And uh, you probably won't have to look that up now, but two years ago I had to look it up, you know, and that's thousands of terabytes, is the amount of data that's coming across. So this network is capable of shifting that kind of volume of data. In that case, from Switzerland, um, and actually, to give that group as an example, they have a video conference. This thing about where you open a video conference and close it off, I'm not convinced is going to be the long-term model. <laughs> and what we do within the physics group is it opens and it stays open. They just leave it. It's because it's, it's traversing the internet anyway. You know, you're not paying a per-call cost. Um, just leave it open. And you kind of walk in, you talk, you walk out again. Um, and you think with, com you know, with compression, it shouldn't really matter, should it? If nobody's in the room, it's just compressed down and nothing anyway. Um, and down here, Adam Brooks is down here somewhere, and uh, good things, that, that, you know, the stuff you care about, it kind of comes out of Adam Brooks. Uh, it includes, there is, you know, there's gene sequencing or DNA sequencing. The, the work that was reported a month ago um, from the Adam Brooks campus is actually gene sequencing the um, uh, cancer, lung cancer uh, uh, cells, cancerous cells of lung cancer and cancerous cells or some other cancer, I forget, pancreatic, I can't remember which it is, but actually do the, doing the DNA sequencing of, of those cells. It's no longer just a, a normal human body. It's kind of it's, it's, uh, DNA sequence cancerous cells, and then let's work out what the delta is between, between, that, delta, between that, de that DNA sequence and a, and a correct DNA sequence and work out what the difference is. And that is going to make a massive difference to the genetic treatment of those disorders. Massive difference. Um, that is petabytes. OK, so that's, but there's, there's data being processed somewhere up here, and it's coming from down here. Nevertheless, this network, there are times when 50% of the traffic on this network is video. And uh, we don't, for what it's worth, record video record lectures. You know, if you're just a, a uh, lecturer standing up delivering a course, 
we're not clear about why you want a video. It, it means an undergraduate wouldn't have to bother attending the lecture, which is a big plus for the undergraduate. Um, um, but kind of not, not sure. But what we do do is we video talks. So a talk and a lecture is two different things. If somebody comes along, somebody suitably prestigious comes along, is going to talk about black holes. Um, Cambridge is a big place. We will video that for posterity. Other people might want to watch it. It could be anything, you know, some analysis of Arabic scripts. I'll give you another um, example of the kind of thing happens at Cambridge. It was only last week I got a cease and desist order from some company in the United States saying there was a denial of service attack coming onto their uh, property, their uh, website, basically, from Cambridge. What it actually turned out to be, the, the, you know, I've talked a lot about science and stuff like that, the arts and humanities, when I kind of say to them, uh, do you think you're the orphan children on this technology, getting kind of the cheap end of it, or do you think you're getting a free ride on infrastructure we're putting in for people doing science? Their answer is very consistent. You know, the arts and humanities, School of Humanities and Social Sciences, a very big group of people. They say, absolutely neither of those. We know exactly what we are doing with technology and why we are using it and what we are seeking to achieve with it. And that denial of service attack was actually somebody doing a statistical variance analysis of an English-Spanish dictionary that happened to be hosted by this company. They were hosting an online English-Spanish dictionary. And this researcher was collecting that data, doing a statistical analysis on it, and comparing it with some other corpus of Spanish text. Um, but that guy was in the arts and, arts and humanities. So the, the use of this, this platform is very widespread and it's, it's, it's not limited to the sciences. Um, nevertheless, 50% of that traffic can be video. Um, and these talks we, we, we video on black holes or some abstruse bit of mathematics or um, some stem cell talk or something like that, we serve, so that is our content. Now, of this video, I've got to assume a big chunk of it is undergraduates looking at stuff they're not supposed to be looking at on the internet. You know, that's a video going the other way. Um, we serve, so of that video content that you think would be a fairly niche interest, we serve 10,000 videos a day. We built a streaming media service. So we thought, well, we're accumulating this video. It was only a year and three quarters ago, we thought, we think we might need to build a streaming media service because we think we are accumulating this video content, but we didn't know. We didn't, you know, didn't know that for a fact because we didn't have any coordinated support for video within the enterprise. So we built a streaming media service. It's now 100 terabytes, and it is streaming 10,000 videos a day. And of course, we started catching up. You know, it turned out these people all over the place had this video that they had nowhere to put it. They were videoing stuff. Um, so uh, you know, video is kind of much more significant than I would have expected. There's an interesting thing in the enterprise collaboration platform now renamed Quad, um, which is, it has, you can't, sorry, you can't read it on my slide, but uh, it has a My View, which is kind of the iGoogle, it's sort of where you're pulling stuff together that you want to see, and it has something else called My Profile, which is where you edit, you, you can accumulate stuff about you. They're kind of two different, My View, so Facebook has only got My Profile, you know, there's, there's no My View equivalent iGoogle has only got the My View, hasn't got the, hasn't got the My Profile part, and that kind of fundamentally stuffs both those products. SharePoint has sites. It doesn't have people in it. Although you can do anything with it. I'm giving a grain of sand. You can build anything, right? Um, but the dominant uh, dimension of SharePoint is, the, is, is this site. So you're kind of structuring sites and kind of creating them. You would need to do work to try and make it person-centric, and you could. You could take that platform and kind of say, actually, what we're going to do is going to default page for every employee and that's going to say, what sites are they in? What can you communicate? The interesting thing about the Cisco platform is it's a little bit newer than the others. And they've come from their base of strength and communication. You know, you want to IM somebody, email somebody, look at, look at what they've shared with you on a forum or whatever it is. Um, so it has both a uh, My Profile page and a My View page, which is interesting. And my very last point, I'll skip on from that. Oh, go back. My very last point is to make this page successful, uh, which is like the CRM system at Merrill Lynch, is you have to pack it out with automatically generated content. You cannot assume that the user is going to just, from the goodness of his heart, is going to put a ton of stuff on his own my, my, my profile page so that somebody else would actually want to see it. They just won't. So if you're taking the equivalent of, say, the Pirelli page, or there is a John Chambers page in the CRM system at Merrill Lynch, it is pre-populated with information that has been gleaned from, from other systems about what revenue has Merrill Lynch received 
from Cisco. That's kind of hard to get. You've got to go into some sort of financial system to get it. Uh, it also says, what has Merrill Lynch spent with Cisco, which comes from, a compl that's from the accounts payable system, I think, and it's a completely different system. And you pull that onto, in this case, the John it's the Cisco page, not the John Chambers page. The John Chambers page has who has communicated with John Chambers most recently, because you can pick that up from the email. JP Morgan Chase have on the John Chambers page, they do have a John Chambers page, who knows him the best, right? And the way they get that information is they trawl the contacts pages in exchange and see how big they are. So they're looking, you know, so that they can, they can put stuff on the John Chambers page that gives me an incentive to go and look at it. If I'm an employee, you know, if I'm an investment banker, I'm going to go and talk to John Chambers. I don't have to go to the John Chambers page. I already know the guy. But I've got an incentive to, get, to actually go and look at it because it will have stuff already, already on there. And let's, let's just call that automatically generated content. Um, you know, if you haven't got that, you will not persuade people uh, to go into the system. So uh, that's the kind of question... I've attempted to answer. Some of the stuff we're doing at Cambridge will ripple into the corporate world, and I'm not trying to pretend we have the answers, because we kind of don't. We're trying to pull together a mishmash of stuff. Um, but I think we've got some f fundamental things that we know we need to do to make it successful. Okay. Thank you very much.